Welcome to the global engagement series on public purpose in the time of COVID-19. Uh, this event is part of a series that is hosted by the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. Uh, I'm Antonio Andreoni, I'm an associate professor and uh, head of research at the Institute, and I will be chairing this panel discussion and follow up broader audience engagement. I'm very pleased we have more than 300 uh, register for uh, this event from several countries. I'm also very pleased to have with us three very distinguished uh, experts to address a very challenging topic uh, that we set for ourselves for this event. Uh, one crisis leads to another, challenges and responses across emerging economies in the time of COVID-19. Uh, the speakers are Alicia Barsenibara, the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, who will be joining later, based in Santiago, Chile, Professor Jayati Ghosh from the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at the University from New Delhi, and finally Richard Cotterwright, Director of the Globalization and Development Strategies Division at UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, is joining us from Geneva. So welcome, welcome to our speakers. Uh, we are particularly pleased to have these three speakers because they are truly uh, taught global leaders who have been engaged at the forefront of the discussion on the government and also the multilateral uh, responses initiatives uh, to uh, fight the pandemic and the crisis. And they bring to the discussion both global and regional perspective across a variety of emerging economies. Um, just to give you a few references, Ankita has been a leading global voice for emerging economies on several tables from trade negotiation to international debt and macroeconomic responses. ECLAC is, on the other hand, uh, a very important active regional UN agency who has been extremely uh, critical in reminding us the critical role that structural imbalances, regional imbalances, but also government capabilities and uh, other a uh, specific set of trade industrial policy play in building inclusive and sustainable development pathway. Finally, Professor Jayati Ghosh is one of the most authoritative voices from uh, the South Asia context, in particular in India, where she's done extensive work on political economy development, macroeconomic issues and government. So we have three very unique perspectives on the challenges and the different responses that governments have been putting in place across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Of course, we are talking a very uh, set of diverse economies with very different economic structures, different geographies, different social institutional settings, and particularly important for this discussion, different, different type of government capabilities. So these are all important factors that will uh, come out to our discussion and to uh, the engagement later on on specific country uh, experiences. Last week, as part of this series, we've been focusing on uh, whatever it takes, the macroeconomic response to COVID-19, looking at, in particular, advanced industrial economies. Today, we want actually to turn our attention to the big uh, uh, type of challenges that emerging economies are facing. And I would say the title of this event already suggests that we are talking about a crisis, but also multiple crises at the same time. The global pandemic has highlighted how our societies and economies rely on a complex set of systemic interdependencies cutting across economic sectors, institutions, and as a result of that, exactly because of these interdependencies, a disruption in one sector, one activity, one institution, can turn an health crisis into several other crises. And we have been seeing how this escalation can be faster, especially in those countries which are less re resilient in their economies, but also in their government capabilities and response. So the fast escalation of food crisis, trade disruption, limited fiscal capacity and debt sustainability are going to be major concern in our discussion today. Of course, the extent to which one crisis is leading to another is still unknown. There are fundamental uncertainties here and unexpected crises could unfold over the coming months. In some cases, even government responses can lead to 
unintended consequences. There has been big discussion around, for example, the use of digital technologies for tracking in a number of uh, countries. And of course, not only at the national level, but at geopolitical level, there are emerging tensions that have uh, challenged uh, the response at the multilateral level. If we think about the problem of coordinating a response in the discovery for a vaccine and the follow-up problem in terms of scaling up the production of vaccines and other medical devices to support the response, uh, we have plenty of uh, issues uh, on the table. And of course, managing these crises properly will have dramatic long lasting effects. UN studies have already reported that the global poverty could increase for the first time since 1990, and that such an increase could represent a reversal of approximately 10 years in the world progress in the fight of, uh, against poverty. ANCTAD has also monitored the impact that the pandemic is having on global trade, dropping global trade in the first quarter of 2020 to approximately, approximately 3%, with a, a projected quarter on quarter decline of almost 30%. And of course, there are many other related issues that could affect emerging economies who are very much integrated into global value chain. The disruption of these chains might also affect the availability of fundamental key uh, provision of goods. If we think about, in particular, the sub-Saharan African context, the World Bank has already estimated that the industrial output is going to drop from uh, 40 to up to 80 billion uh, in 2020. And of course, these countries are going to be vulnerable to both direct and indirect uh, crisis in global demand and FDI. So against this background, we've invited our speakers to start this debate with an initial set of remarks on the global and regional situation, the unfolding crisis in emerging economies, but also how governments are responding to this crisis. And here we are very much interested in exploring uh, if there have been specific government models that have been working more than others, but also what role multilateral initiatives and international organizations like ANCTAD, CEPAL, and others can play in this specific context. Indeed, if we think about these crises, while there has been uh, lots of focus on the short-term response, in the medium-long term, there is definitely a rediscovery of the role of the state, the importance of government in stepping up in time of crisis as the lender of last resort, but also the government as an investor of first resort in good time towards building more resilient societies and economies. So without further ado, I'm inviting now, starting with uh, Richard Kozu Wright, uh, to uh, provide the first set of remarks. We will then move to Jayati and Alicia, and we will, as announced in the beginning, we'll be collecting questions throughout the talk so that we can actually uh, involve uh, all the audience in the uh, second part of the talk. Richard, the floor is yours. Antonio, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation and good afternoon and uh, perhaps good morning to everybody too. Um, as you said, I, I mean, UNCTAD comes at this challenge from a particular perspective. We don't have a regional or a country level perspective. So we, we are looking for the kind of systemic, underlying systemic uh, weaknesses and asymmetries, uh, gaps in the global economy that tend to um, affect developing countries in their totality rather than really drilling down into the specifics of different regions or different countries. And, and so, and as you said in your remarks at the beginning, you know, there are a set of structural problems that continue to hold back inclusive and sustainable development in the South, the lack of, you know, the lack of diversification in their economies, the, the extensive nature of informality uh, in, in, in the workplace, um, the vulnerability to external shocks, high dependence on external markets, particularly in recent years, financial markets uh, as a source of uh, resources, the uh, restrictions on fiscal space and the, and the weaknesses that poses uh, for, the, for, the, for the state, asymmetric power relations in general, 
at the at the uh, uh, firm and the multilateral level. So I mean, that's the focus. And in many respects, the COVID-19 crisis has shone a very bright light on all of those uh, weaknesses that developing countries face. And to some extent, you know, we can when we look at the evolution of this crisis, you, it's pretty apparent that developing country concerns were very secondary in the beginning of this crisis, even though they were hit very quickly by the, by the combined shock of both the health pandemic and the economic uh, consequences that, that followed from that. So, you know, if you look at, if you look at, if you take the G20 finance ministers meeting in Riyadh in late February as a kind of benchmark, you know, the discussions there were on climate change. Mnuchin was waxing lyrically again about the entrepreneurial model of the United States. And there was, and in fact, I think they actually, um, I think they actually slightly upgraded their growth performance for, for, uh, for uh, uh, 2020. So th that was around the 23rd of February, right? And then in, in the space of about 10 days, it's a kind of another 10 days that shook the world, you've got a, a, a fundamental shift, right? The, 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 the purchases manager, the, the, um, the, the purchases manager index in China for manufacturing at least collapsed. Uh, Italy locked down and there was the uh, increasing spat between Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia over oil prices, all in the space of two weeks. And the following Monday, uh, 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 after the oil spat became apparent, markets collapsed, essentially. And the focus was very immediately on what the uh, core of the G20 countries would do about this, the United States, the European Union, and China, and there was very little concern about developing countries, even though, as we know, capital, I mean, there was a huge amount of capital flight from developing countries in the month of March, following the, the, this series of events, far, much, much steeper than occurred during the global financial crisis. Um, there was a, a, an immediate uh, increase in the spreads on, on bonds. There was, there was a collapse in, in currencies. Currencies were hit almost simultaneously as a consequence of these of, of the growing anxiety of investors and the, and the flight to safety. And at the same time, the, these countries were, were being squeezed uh, on, the exchange, on the foreign exchange front as supply chains broke down and, and, and exports collapsed and remittances you know, were dropping and tourist revenues were, were, were drying up. And you know, there was a real sense of a potential for a very vicious circle catching hold in, 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 in developing countries. That was pretty apparent to us, not least because already at the end of last year, the consequences of mounting levels of debt in the developing world were already causing a lot of distress and default indeed in many, in many countries. So, so, so there was a real kind of perfect storm for, 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 for many developing countries being hit very hard. But you know, the focus remained very much on what advanced economies, what, the, what would the Fed do in response to this crisis was the kind of real fixation. At, and, and to some extent, the, the Fed did step up to the plate, but it had very little impact on developing countries. Uh, you know, the extension of credit, uh, uh, credit lines and, 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 um, and swaps was restricted to a handful of developing countries, the favored developing countries, Brazil, Mexico, et cetera. So, so in, and then, and then as, as, the, as the crisis kind of, deepened and concerns grew there was a growing hope and expectation that the g20 and the imf and the world bank would somehow come round to the need to live up to the mantra of the advanced economies that we will do whatever it takes to help developing countries get through a crisis that was clearly not of their of their making uh, and you know a lot of expectation in the run up to the spring conference in 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 Washington virtual spring conference that there would be a large injection of special drawing rights to ease the liquidity constraints on developing countries that there would be a significant amount of debt relief to ensure that liquidity crises did not uh, morph into solvency crises uh, uh, and that fiscal space would at least be retained in some way, which was essential in this kind of crisis, given the kind of expenditures that developing countries would have to undertake in response to the shock. So, and, and so there was a real expectation, I think, that something significant would 
emerge from this from from and, and it didn't happen you know when we when we looked at the kinds of things that were on offer by the g20 uh, i mean the sdr uh, issue quickly dropped off the off the table because the americans and i think the indians too were not in, interested in in that option and the kind of debt relief that was being promised was of a marginal nature given the size of the of the of, of the financing problem that developing countries were facing so you know the, 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 I think our hopes were somewhat dashed that there would be a serious kind of rethinking of the of the of the of the international response in the face of this kind of crisis, and it hasn't emerged. And and we and we stand still at a, a place in the in, at least in the international discussions where things have essentially ground to a halt. There's not really been any movement over the last. A uh, month or so since since the IMF World Bank meetings to suggest that um, advanced economies at least are willing to do more. Indeed, when when we start to hear what they want to do in the context of the WTO, uh, you, you know, the, 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 we're, we're inching back towards a business as usual type response to this crisis. And the the rhetoric, and despite their own huge, and it's, and despite, of course, the fact that they have torn up the neoliberal policy playbook themselves, and either ignored or 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 or, or just um, rejected the kind of international norms and rules that they themselves have been playing by for the last three decades. That's clear in the WTO. It's, you know, subsidy, the issue of subsidies, which was a big issue for them, has been thrown overboard because they're subsidizing their businesses like mad. Uh, same with the, the, the response of the European Union. So, I mean, so there's a real kind of, despite that, despite the fact that, the, the, as you said, there's a clear need to bring the state back in, and that's what advanced economies are doing, there's been no attempt to think what that means in terms of the response that developing countries need to be able to deal with a, a, this kind of combination of both a health and a major economic shock. I think you, you emphasize very well the fact, you know, all these macroeconomic conditions are also connected to the way in which the trade sector, the global trade scenario is going to be reshaped by the crisis in terms of government actually reshoring lots of activities or reducing the amount of trade, the geopolitical tensions between China and the US, of course, will have lots of emerging economies who use these markets either as access to uh, supply or as final markets as, a, as an important uh, effect. So do you see a significant contraction in terms of trade? What is your uh, specific perspective on that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, demand is collapsing. Once demand collapses, you know, trade is shopping across borders. Of course, trade is going to, is going to drop in that context. So we, we've kind of given up on the game of trying to really predict what will happen. I mean, we start, everyone started you know, making predictions in the first few months. And as they got more and more kind of anxious and, and significant, it's very difficult to say, partly because it's very difficult to, to make a, a, a reasonable judgment about the impact of these very large relief and containment packages that the advanced economies uh, have have already introduced themselves. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, is the global economy going to go into recession? Absolutely. This year it will be in recession. Will that have a negative impact on global trade? Obviously, it will have a negative in impact on global trade. Will there be some reshoring um, uh, in a kind of medium term by advanced economies as they themselves t talk more about res re the need to build resilience in certain sectors, obviously health-related uh, sectors? Yeah, that's probably uh, going to happen. What the medium term consequences are, though, will very much depend on the policy response of both the national and the international levels. Great. Let me just remind everyone that we collect questions throughout the speech, so you are very welcome to uh, start posting some of the initial questions. And while we do that, uh, Jayati, I would like to bring you into the discussion. Uh, and of course, you have a very privileged position in terms of understanding what's going on in India, but also in the broader region. It would be very interesting to get some of your more specific perspective on that. Thanks a lot, Antonio. It's a great pleasure to be here and get a chance to discuss with my old friend Richard. Uh, yeah, I think Richard has already laid out the essential issues, but you know, there are really, I think for those of us in the developing world who are 
actually also following what's going on globally. I think it's fascinating to see the very different kinds of both context and response in developing countries. And it's not just India, I think it's a broader issue. First is that, you know, we actually got the economic crisis. In fact, I will call it economic catastrophe. We got it before we got the disease. The pandemic is still playing out. I mean, we are really just, you know, in the uh, early stages, I would say, in many of our countries of the, the disease itself playing out. And yet, not only did we have all of the external headwinds that Richard has talked about, you know, very, very severe, which would have created a perfect storm in themselves, but we imposed very, very substantial lockdowns. I mean, the containment measures in many developing countries have been far more severe than they've been in many developed countries. And that has caused an, a further economic collapse. So if it weren't bad enough that we were getting all of these terrible things happening to us from the global economy, whether it's the collapse in foreign exchange earnings or the reversal of capital flows and the associated depreciation and all of that, we also have actually stopped economic activity in many of our countries. And so we are going to have domestic economic declines, which are, I would say, probably much larger than the declines that we're seeing in most of the developed world. So the first is that we have actually an economic catastrophe that I think is the biggest that we've ever had in, in a century, not just my lifetime and so on. I mean, bigger than the Great Depression, bigger than anything that we can speak of in history, because we're talking about very, very major contractions in economic output. Uh, Richard said, it's, we, it's true, we can't predict, but for this quarter, most of the uh, unofficial estimates for India, we don't have the official ones yet, unofficial estimates are anywhere between 20 to 30% decline in GDP. In a large number of developing countries, and there's nobody talking about less than 5%, most people are in the 10 to 20% range for many developing countries. So we're talking very, very large economic contractions in economies where at least 70% of the workforce is usually informal. That is, they have no legal or social protection. So when the economy contracts, they lose their jobs or they lose half of their self-employed income or all of their self-employed income. So we are talking about immediate devastation of livelihoods and of incomes and demand uh, beyond, because we have many, uh, as a, the, the large proportion of informal workers also means we have fewer automatic stabilizers. We, we typically don't have unemployment insurance. We typically don't have other kinds of social protection that ensure people can have something in this period. So the last two months have actually been complete devastation for a very significant proportion across the developing world. So I think the first point is that, that we have actually had our economic catastrophe before we got the pandemic. Second point, the pandemic is just beginning for us. I mean, all this stuff about, you know, the curve flattening and all, whatever it is, many countries in the world are not seeing this. And it's not just in India, it's in Africa, it's in several Latin American countries that we are seeing an explosion of cases. And it, it's not necessarily following a given pattern that is going to peak at a certain point. We don't know. There's no evidence that it will necessarily peak at a particular point. So how it will play out is completely unclear. And it is now coming on a country or on countries which are extremely debilitated already because of the economic collapse. So it's coming, if you like, uh, it's, 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 it's a pandemic that is going to hit economies that already have significant comorbidities, as the current term is. And so it's actually going to be more devastating. And I think the third very remarkable and striking thing is the complete variation in fiscal responses. I mean, Richard was talking about it, right? That you have all of this massive increase, these big fiscal stimuli. I think the latest thing in the US would make it 14, 15% of GDP and the UK 11%, Japan, I don't know, I had 22%, but whatever it is, very, very large fiscal stimuli. Even Germany is doing 5% of GDP additional spending. Most of the developing world, the actual additional fiscal spending that has been announced so far is very low. Among the highest is, say, South Africa with about 3.5% additional fiscal spending. In India, the best calculations come to less than 1% of GDP additional spending. And that's probably going to be sought to be financed by cutting on expending elsewhere, so that over the full year, we might actually see a negative stimulus from government spending. 
So what we are getting is a complete contrast in terms of government's either ability or willingness to shore up economies through providing demand in a situation where there's a complete collapse of demand from households and private investors. So I think that is a very, very sharp difference, which changes the picture dramatically. So it, it means that while we can't predict very much, we certainly, we don't know how long it, this thing will last, how much it will spread, whether there will be a quick recovery at least from the disease that will enable some revival and all that. We can't predict all of that, but we can certainly predict that all of the elements that could provide demand stimulus, they're all turning negative. Yeah. And that's, uh, that I don't think has ever really happened before to such an amazing degree. Right. So that in turn, I think, is, is going to generate all kinds of new different political and social results, which at least in the short term will be mostly unpleasant, and possibly more unpleasant than they already are. Uh, but in the medium term could, could work out in all kinds of unexpected ways. I think, I think you bring in this important dimension that we are talking about economies where the level of informality is very high and the government capability is also quite limited both in terms of fiscal capacity but also in terms of implementation. Despite that, we have some you know, relatively positive stories in few countries. For example, in the context of South Africa, you mentioned about their sort of attempt to have a more robust fiscal response, but at the same time, the... Uh, they have been able to mobilize part of their uh, health institutions and networks that were set up to fight HIV and try to reconvert some of these uh, facilities in order to support some of these response. I think in a previous conversation we had, you were mentioning about interesting uh, implementation efforts in the Kerala state. Would you like to say something more about that? Yeah, you know, I think it's quite interesting that there are some relatively small uh, areas uh, that have been quite successful in dealing with the pandemic, containing it, and also dealing with, with as uh, little of the economic disruption as possible. And so definitely Vietnam is a very interesting example. Uh, Cuba is a very interesting example against all kinds of odds. And in India, the, because it's a federal system, and so state governments have a lot of roles, the rather small state of Kerala, which has a lot of foreign migrants, was the first state to actually get the infection, but managed to contain it to the point where they have had only four deaths. And despite a large number of cases, everybody has been more or less cured. And until the latest influx of migrants from abroad, they had actually got rid of new infections for more than two weeks. So how have they done it? What has been significant about these? And I think what's really interesting about all of these is that these have been states that have relied much more on uh, a participatory type of pandemic control rather than a top down you know that the rest of the country in india and certainly in many other countries it's been this decision from above okay now we lock down now you can't do all of the, the following things and we want to tell you what you can do instead and we will not even tell you how you can survive instead i think the difference in kerala in cuba and in, in vietnam is that you actually explained to the population that these are the things that you have to do and why, and enabled them to do that. You didn't announce to people in cities where, you know, 40% live in slums, where they're extremely congested and there are five to 10 people in a room. You didn't tell them, oh, you have to do social distancing and main, maintain six feet distance from each other all the time, when they're living in 10 by 10 rooms, five of them, right? So I think uh, recognizing these specific conditions, enabling people, to do what is required for pandemic control and providing the social assistance and protection that is required. These were all absolutely essential. All of these require not just democratic states or whatever, they require empathetic states. And I think that's a big difference. Huh? We, in India, we supposedly have a democracy. Our central government is not empathetic in the least. It's been shown very much in uh, a different kind of response in the aggregate. So I think the big difference and where, can, where countries or states have managed to achieve better results is where they have shown less of an extreme class or race or gender bias in the policy responses and where they've actually sought to explain to people and enable people to deal with these terrible outcomes. I think, I think you, you know, you probably Richard wants to join on that as well, but you raise an important point. We don't have 
one model of response, but there are different levels of government engagement into the crisis. And this has been seen also among advanced economies where some regions, even within the same country, have done better than others in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, the fact that countries, the countries you mentioned, have also a significant tradition in terms of building up this sort of more uh, engaged political economy processes, where there are lots of constituencies who are pretty much involved in the policy process, and that allows to have probably a faster response. Richard, what is your perspective on the specific role of the state and different type of responses that you've been observing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with Janet at all. I, I think it's interesting to make a comparison with the kind of narrative that was coming out of developing countries a decade ago after the fact. I mean, people will remember that a decade ago, all the talk was about developing countries having decoupled from the shocks that emanated from the advanced world and, that's, and that somehow they, they'd established these new, this kind of new growth dynamic you know, a lot of focus on the BRICS, obviously, the Latin American countries had come out of a, and, and had done, you know, had made important changes on the back of the so-called pink tide. Uh, China was obviously steaming ahead and, and was kind of contemplating how to move from a reliance on, on low tech to more medium and high. So there's a real, now, so there's this kind of real confidence in a way coming out of the last crisis that developing countries had somehow break and, broken this old pattern of, of defendants, which, which I mean, at least we in UNCTAD were always slightly skeptical of, given what we saw of, as many of the growth drivers in the developing world in the opening decade of the new millennium. But, the, but there was this confidence there. And, and that's, that seems to have gone when we, when we kind of look at, at uh, you know, China still, but even China, which was instrumental in the recovery after 2009, has not adopted the same kind of um, uh, aggressive expansionary, it announced some uh, earlier uh, uh, this weekend at the, at the National Congress, but, but it hasn't done what, what it did after the 2009 uh, crisis. So, I mean, there, there is a kind of, there's a, you know, the, the, and, and a lot of the, um, institutional voices in the South are, 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 much, are, are much weaker these days. So I think, you know, there is a real, I, I, think, I think there are clearly differences across the South in terms of state capacity. That's, that's just, that's clear. Um, but as a, as a collective bod, as a, a, a collective group that can respond to this crisis, there's very little sign that the developing world has a clear, a positive agenda that can address the kind of short-term uh, shocks that it's hit, that, that are hitting them, and also think um, more uh, ambitiously about how they can recover in a much more resilient way than than was the case after 0809. I mean, there is a real shift there, I think, in the confidence of the developing world. Uh, the, uh, in, in response to COVID-19. And so, I mean, the, I, you know, there are clearly success stories and particularly on the health front, uh, developing countries in, you know, the UK can hardly stand up as a, as a paragon of virtue when it comes to responding to the health crisis and many developing countries, including in sub-Saharan Africa, have clearly done better. But as a, as a, as a, as a kind of, you know, when you look at the economic um, years ahead, it looks fairly bleak for most developing countries, I think. And this, before we move to Alicia, uh, this brings me to one of the questions that have been raised by the audience, uh, by Jay Kanas, saying, do you think that globalization is dead officially? The next stage will be regionalism or nationalism? And what the impact for developing economies? Would you like to have a quick response? We, we, I'm sure we will be back to this with Alicia uh, uh, later on. But, a quick response to this first question. Uh, well, you know, I wish financial globalization were dead. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's alive and kicking a bit too much, kicking a bit too hard at the moment. <laughs> globalization has died and risen from the dead on numerous occasions in in our in the in the past. So I think it would be. I, I think the issue is what kind of globalization can we achieve moving forward? It's not a, it's, I mean, this debate about deglobalization de uh, is, I find slightly uh, uh, not, not very constructive. Uh, I mean, it's what kind of globalization can we uh, 
can we actually see and can we make a different kind of globalization than the, the hyper globalization that has proved so destructive over the last two decades? I think that's really the big question. Thanks. Alicia, welcome. I'm, I'm pleased that we managed to sort out our uh, technical issues. Um, we have uh, really started the discussion with uh, Richard and Jayati on both the global perspective, of course, ANCTA has a very privileged perspective in that sense, and uh, with what is happening in a number of emerging economies. And of course, uh, ECLAC is a, a key player in, the, in Latin America and the Caribbean region, and has been extremely active over the last years in actually raising many concerns about imbalances, about the resilience of the economy, how to get the government working for more inclusive, more transformative, innovative, greener solution. Uh, and you've been extremely active also in your role in the broader UN family uh, in promoting this type of ideas. Uh, would be great to have your inputs uh, into this discussion and in particular, uh, give us some perspective on what is happening also in the Latin American context and how you see government response in that, in that context. Thanks. Thank you so much, Antonio and, and Yayati. I'm so glad to be with you and with Richard. And I'm sorry for my glitch on the, on the timing, but here I am and very happy to participate and to tell you that we are confronting in Latin America and the Caribbean the perfect storm. Because this is the perfect storm, in, 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 and you were talking about globalization. And one of the problems we have, and I, I'm going to quote Mariana Mazzucato on this, is that decades of privatization, outsourcing, budget cuts in the name of efficiency have significantly hampered many governments, many governments to respond to anything, but most importantly, to respond to the COVID. 19 crisis because this is already hitting us with a lot of structural problems that we have been uh, I mean we have been unable to cope with and this is why I'm talking about the perfect storm because as you say one crisis brings to another well this crisis the pandemics is, is is evidencing I would say putting in evidence the crisis we were bringing from before which is the lack of, of social protection the lack of investment on the on the state on the public goods let me put it that way and and i would say the reducing investments in core public sector capabilities and i think this is so important capabilities for innovation capabilities for change and 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 we are facing the perfect storm because we have internal conditions but external conditions that the developed countries are not facing. So this is a very unfair globalization, if I may say. Very unfair because it has always been hitting the developing countries. We have never fit it in this globalization scheme where I would say at the, at the, I would say at the beginning, let's say the WTO was a creation of the US and this and that and the other, but the, the, at the time that China came in, then they started saying, oh no, we don't like this and so forth. Now that the, the discussions and the negotiations are benefiting the developing countries, now they want to get away of the WTO. So this is what we have been confronting. This, this you know, these uh, tremendous asymmetries at the global level that we don't want that type of the globalization. Indeed, we don't. And, and we, we have to, to fight for, for, for a different thing. But the other thing we are facing here now is the declining in trade, of course. The fragmentation of the value global chains is, is at stake because now countries and, and big companies, by the way, they would like to go for resilience rather than efficiency. And this is what's happening today. And that previous, I would say, statement of zero stock, which was the, the, the classical uh, behavior of globalization before, is no longer there. I think companies are thinking of reshoring or bringing things closer or proximity, geographical proximity. So we're probably going to face a totally new economic geography. Now, where does developing countries and Latin America and the Caribbean fit on this new, uh, new economic geography? That's for me the greatest question because we are going to, uh, if, if, if ever, after the pandemic, we're going to be more poor. I mean, we're going to have 30 million more poor in the region. We're going to be uh, less, uh, le uh, more unequal. We're probably going to have more, more uh, Gini coefficient than ever. We are going to have uh, unemployment, probably uh, 37.7 million unemployed people only in, in this year. And of course, 
we are going to have uh, the problem of, uh, of the productive structure because uh, these pandemics is hitting, I would say, is hitting the productive st structure in the heart, in the heart. And we have never been able to put ourselves together in more productivity with more innovation. We have not been able to do that. Do you think after the pandemics we're going to be able to do that? We have to rethink and, and, and indeed uh, just to say that we are uh, particularly facing also problems of financing for development. I mean, honestly, and UNCTAD has been very voice, voice, uh, voiceful there. And I want to thank Richard and, and UNCTAD because you have been saying that we need a debt standstill and that's what we need. And we need a, a rate, a credit rating that the agencies, the credit rating agencies also give us a standstill because if they continue rating us down and down and down, we will never have access to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, I mean, the money that we need to confront this crisis and many others. And lastly, but not least, uh, Antonio, I know I'm, I'm, I'm arriving late, but let me say that the international community has to be ready to face many issues. And one of them is to provide us with special drawing rights. I think we need special drawing rights. Secondly, we need to confront and to, to have a, a stop to the capital flight. I mean, we have an outflow of $83 billion already uh, of capital flight, and that's impossible. We are not going to be able, if we don't have international cooperation or, or international commitment to stop the capital flight, we're going to have a problem. And also on the fiscal issue, because tax avoidance, for example, in our region, is already costing 6.3% of GDP. I mean, we're talking about almost $330 billion a year. So when they tell me, where, where can we finance things? But from here, we can finance things. And my final point, I, Antonio, I'm sorry, I'm very excited about this meeting, is that in, in ECLAG, we are suggesting a basic uh, emergency income. That could be the first step for a basic universal income. We believe, honestly, that we need to give the citizens of our region the capacity to have a survival income. And I know everybody says, where is this going to come from? Well, I tell you, we have already calculated how much it would cost for the next six months. It will, it will cost around 2% of GDP. And I don't think that's too much. When we, when we see the levels of, uh, of tax avoidance of 6.3% of GDP, I think our, our countries have the capacity to do that if the political will is there. Over to you, Antonio, and thank you for the opportunity of being here. Thanks, Alicia. No, no, we will keep the conversation going. I mean, I think you raised a very important uh, set of uh, problems, both in terms of the uh, response on the demand side and, of course, the uh, importance of providing a form of basic income, especially in a, in a, in a uh, critical stage after an individual of this crisis, but also how the productive structure of these countries has been affected. I mean, you raised the problem of lack of investment and, of course, the fact that this crisis can exacerbate the flying out of resources that could be used instead to actually support the transformation of uh, some of these economies. I would like to uh, add to, to what you were saying. Would you suggest there is any experience we've been discussing with Jayati, the overall government response in the region, and trying also to find positive cases of some positive response or some example that we can learn from. Would you like to bring any uh, case or any initiatives that you think is worth uh, consideration also for other emerging economies? Thank you so much. I mean, we have an array of examples here in, in the region, of course. We have countries that have, uh, I mean, responded, you, you mean responding to the, to the pandemics, right? Uh, so we do have countries that have put together a fiscal stimulus package that is very powerful. For example, Peru, almost 8% uh, of GDP uh, and also supporting companies and amounting to 12% of GDP in total. The problem of Peru is that inequality is so big that on, they have put together a lockdown that has been working and so forth. But the, the economies, the informal economy in Peru is 70% of informality. The average in our region is 54%. So how do we cope with a region that is so unequal? 
Inequalities is the name of the game here. And, and in our countries, lockdown precisely doesn't work that well. Now, the other country that has put a lot of measures forward is Chile, of course, the country I'm in. But of course, they are, they are in a big debate right now whether they go and save companies or not. They, should they provide or not liquidity to big companies like, like airlines, for example, as Lufthansa was saved by, by Germany, for example, should they do the same and on what conditions? And uh, there is no clarity whether these deals with companies are going to include the protection of employment. The only country that has dealt with that very forcefully is Argentina. Even with the problems Argentina has, the negotiations of Argentina with the private sector and with the syndicate, with the unions has been so interesting that they are saving companies, but preserving employment. And I think that's a very interesting example. The other extreme is Mexico. Many people criticize Mexico because they think that they are not focusing enough on the pandemics. They are focusing on the pandemics. The thing is that the president of Mexico started to protect the vulnerable population before the pandemic. So he's already providing a lot of income support to the poor, to the vulnerable, to the indigenous peoples that is going to be, uh, that's going to be important for this crisis. Now, the problematic there is the negotiations with the private sector because Mexico doesn't want to commit the same mistake they did in 2008 where they save a lot of companies and at the end of the day, they were the winners. The concentration was increased. The poor were more poor. The rich were more, more rich. So these are the, the challenges that I think this region is facing. But overall, I would say, I mean, of course, the worst case is Brazil because Brazil is privileging the economy and there's a big uh, political problem there. But I think that the other uh, dilemma here, Antonio, is whether we want a social state or an authoritarian state. The dangers of having authoritarian states is there. And, and, the, and the, the civil unrest that was before these pandemics can come back. And I think that's, that's really the problem because at the end of this crisis, we're going to be poorer, we're going to be unequal, we're going to be hungry, and we're going to be angry. And I think this is what, uh, what uh, we need to, to look at. What type of social compact, what type of uh, social or, or new deal is going to be, is going to be uh, provided by the states, the private sector, and the society? Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. I mean, you, you brought in key issues. I mean, we are going to have an entire event on how the crisis is leading to increasing inequalities and what type of inequalities within and across countries but also the issues of conditionalities. And in IPT, we have been discussing a lot about experiences of government who have been able to link this crisis, actually try to turn this crisis an opportunity to actually set up a different type of engagement with uh, the private sector and trying to create a more symbiotic relationship, trying to build up uh, into these packages, bailouts packages, opportunities actually for restructuring uh, the different sectors and businesses. I think we have already quite a number of questions here coming. Before I go to one of those, uh, I would like to uh, invite Richard and Jayati to comment on these issues around inequality and conditionalities, because of course, this is a key area for understanding on the one hand, what we do in terms of policies, how we design the policy, and what impact it's going to have in society. Jayati, up to you. Unfortunately, you getting me on something that I'm really very worked up about at the moment, because if you take my country, India, and I hate to take an example which is going to show it in a very bad light, the responses have actually so accentuated and intensified the existing inequalities. The responses have been extremely class oriented, that is to say that they are basically catered towards big capital and the middle classes in general, whether it's the health response or the fiscal response. Uh, they have been completely uh, caste biased. We have a very strong caste system, which is a bit, I suppose, like race in some other countries. They've been extremely patriarchal as well. So they have actually added to existing inequalities in a way which is uh, horrifying. And then the way that the state is dealing with it is precisely what Alicia was just saying a little while ago, is it's actually becoming more authoritarian. And uh, this this increasing it's it's basically this pandemic has become a very convenient way in which you say well look we need emergency powers so they have brought in the disaster management act which is an extremely centralizing act it gives the prime minister 
and his authority complete control to overrule everybody, everything, all institutions, all laws, because it's a national disaster. That centralization has not been accompanied by more coordination with the state governments. They're just imposing their will. But they're also using that power to make all kinds of other decisions, which really have nothing to do with the pandemic, whether it is uh, jailing dissidents, which is happening at an increasing rate per day, or it is taking various other decisions that could not have been done in normal times because everyone's locked in their home and there's no capacity for public protest or dissent and so on. And and the use of surveillance technology. So now we have these tracking apps, which are, of course, the flavor of the month for many governments, right? You're supposed to track people have to carry around these apps. And these tracking apps are effectively being made compulsory because you need now need them to enter offices, to go on train journeys, which are just starting again, even to get on buses, to get basic uh, social services, to get anything, you will have to carry this tracking app with you. And of course, it's supposedly to fi enable the government to see that you're not, you know, how, what you're uh, doing so that they can trace and isolate and test and so on, which would be fine if you did trace, isolate and test, but you don't, you just track. And you're not actually following that up with sufficient testing. India is not alone. There are many other countries and many other governments that have chosen these new technologies as a convenient way to establish greater power of monitoring and surveillance without necessarily the responsibility that comes with it in terms of the public health. So I think there are real concerns, not only about how it's the disease itself, but the responses to the disease that are massively exacerbating uh, inequalities. And they are uh, intensifying the attempt at state control in very, very authoritarian ways, even in so-called democracies. And of course, at the end of that spectrum, uh, and here I'm connecting to one of the questions that came from the audience, uh, from Abdirashi Bursamet, is the fact that you know there are a number of fragile states, states which are almost captured, right? They are not in a democratic setting who can actually uh, be extremely affected in, uh, in that authoritarian turn. Okay. Can I, can I answer that? I saw that Please. question. It's, it referred to Africa. Hey, listen, the US is a much more fragile state than most African countries. So let's get rid of this whole thing that states in Africa and like, poor countries are fragile. I mean, come on. The US is surely a very fragile state at this moment. So I think we should recognize that this is a much broader problem and it doesn't depend on per capita income. Right, right. So I, I guess the problem is <laughs> there are different forms of fragility. And in fact, the country is you know, having a massive death toll after uh, the first months of the crisis clearly uh, is, is the US in that respect. So we, we, I think you, you make an important point in yeah. the, and which also connects to other questions here that we have around state capacity and leadership as well. Richard, would you like to get into well, this? Uh, well, just on this point, I mean, it, uh, clearly uh, highly unequal societies are not resilient. That, that's just a clear fact. And, and clearly uh, inequality has been increasing everywhere over the course of the last uh, you know, two, three decades. That's, it's a broad trend everywhere. I mean, ups and downs and, 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 and variation depending on specific policies that some countries have followed, others haven't. But it's a very broad trend. And, uh, and, and Alicia is, I think, right in that respect. You know, you, you know what frustrates me is that the narrative, although everyone agrees on that, everybody agrees, the narrative around inequality remains very weak. And I think the UN hasn't helped in this respect because they've fallen into the discourse around, about leaving no one behind. And we live, in a world, we live in a world where no one is left behind. I mean, we, this is the most interconnected, interdependent world that, we, we, that we've ever seen. And the idea of leaving, leaving no one behind kind of invokes this notion that inequality is kind of almost an accident that somehow we've forgotten about people and that if we remember them again that somehow we'll be able to deal with this problem whereas in fact the point is that inequality is hardwired into the way in which hyperglobalization is structured around footloose capital around these problems of, of, of market concentration that Alicia uh, talked about and around the capture of the state as economic greater economic power is reinforced by uh, increasing access to, to political power in, in what one 
Chicago scholar has called the Medici vicious circle, which is a phrase I think captures that very nicely. So I, so the, I think we need, to, and, and, and I think Alicia's work at ECLAC about the inefficiency of inequality is incredibly important in this context. It takes away from, I, I, I really find that the leaving no one behind is a very misleading way of thinking about the rules and the structures that perpetuate a world where cost cutting at what the lower end and rent seeking at the higher end are the way in which the model works. That's how the, that's how the system works. It's not, there's no accident here about, about the inequality that comes out of that combination of forces. And I think we need to look much more rigorously at the kind of rules of the development model that has emerged over the last 30 to 40 years and, and, and in the North as well as the South, it's not just, this is not just a developing country issue. If we're gonna come up with ways to connect the inequality agenda to the recovering better and resilience building gender agenda that has emerged out of the COVID-19 uh, uh, shock. So I, I think there are real opportunities there, but we, I'm not sure we have the language yet or the framework for kind of coming up with the necessary policy responses and tailoring those, as, as Janity said, to specific circumstances. Let me just build on that. I mean, I, I think, as in my remarks, introductory remarks, I was pointing out how ECLAC has been central in constantly reminding us the structural nature of some of these unbalances, asymmetries, and the need to look at changes in the structure in order to not simply address the manifestation of phenomenon, but actually going at the core of what, what is driving this, this type of unbalances. Alicia, I would like to uh, involve you again in this, in, on this point because you raised a number of interesting cases across Latin America and a number of specific responses. So also linking up to some of the questions that are coming up specific on Latin America, some questions were about what were the most important factor in the response was leadership or state capacity and how would you, uh, you know, look at them in the, in the specific regional context. Very crucial questions. I, I think that Richard is right, very right. I am very concerned about the narrative of the United Nations as a whole, because indeed, I think that uh, they are, I mean, it seems to me, Richard, and, and you and I are working for that organization, or both of us, but I, I'm very frustrated to see that development is seen to, to address the issues of the vulnerable, and Yayati, you're right. I mean, in, 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 they are looking at the low-income countries, poor, poor, poor guys, and all the development reform is oriented towards the developing countries, but not the development paradigm, let me put it that way, as a whole, including the developed and the developing. They are only looking at how to help the developing as in a essential uh, process. I, I, I hate that. that idea. But anyway, I am in the middle of that uh, discussion with my own institution. <laughs> but I also believe that inequality imposes things on innovation, creativity, and it's, and it's embedded in the culture of the agents. Jayati, you were touching upon that, the culture of privilege, the culture that naturalizes or makes it natural that inequality exists and that the poor are poor because they are poor and the rich are rich because they are rich. And we are focusing on poverty, but not on inequality. I mean, and, and we should focus on inequality because what we want is to, to avoid the concentration of power of technology of instruments that is happening today. And that's where I'm talking about the, 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 the privileges and the asymmetries that we, that we are uh, dealing with. And when, we, when we, we have been working for one decade on inequality and the last document was precisely inefficiency of inequality because I think that this is the, the bottom line. I mean, we have to put it in economic terms to see how inequality has uh, an impact on, on health, on education, on opportunities for people, for women, for, for ethnicity, so so it's not leave no one behind. I, I agree with Richard very much. It's not leaving no one behind, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's bringing everybody, let's say, at the same level of, of, of capacities and access. And, uh, and I think precisely this inequality conspires uh, with, with resilience and conspires with, with the way we are confronting the pandemics. And I'm very worried that we might go back um, ideologically and the narrative will might go back because now government there's no leadership I'm sorry to say in these pandemics is like everybody's responding to the emergency but there's no 
thinking ahead of what type of world do we need and do we want uh, uh, to, to, to establish in a way, what, what are the rules of the game that we want to, to put together. And I agree with very much that we have to look into the basis. And in our case, we're looking very closely to the structural gaps that this region has. We still, we still behave as the periphery, as Previ should put it a long time ago. We still are a commodity-based economies and we have, we are very, very worried that we might come back to reprimarization. I know commodity prices are down now, but if China starts becoming again the engine of growth, again we're going to go to reprimarization. And of course, these were the sectors that were not so affected by the pandemics. Precisely the most affected were services and tourism and you know other types of, of businesses and the winners the winners of the winners are the technology companies and the big ones the ones that are, that are not paying taxes the ones that are there that are concentrating all the wealth again so how are we going to deal with these uh, i would say structural causes of inequality that i think is is, is for us the basics. I mean, if we don't, but, but I'm worried that the world is not, is not moving in that direction. I mean, uh, I think we have a, a, a narrative today that is going back uh, probably before the 70s in the, in the development narrative. That's what I'm, I'm very worried about, uh, Antonio, that we need to recover. And that's why I believe what UNCTAD is also doing is so important. But I know Richard sometimes is lonely within UNCTA, as we are very lonely within the, the, the Secretariat. So that's why partnerships with, with people like you, Antonio, with you, Yayati, with, uh, with Mariana, to think carefully that, uh, that we believe really that the foundations of inequality, for example, in our region come from the colony. Uh, for colonization was, was uh, the first imprint of inequality in our region. And, and this is not gone away. And, and we have a, a lot of problems in terms of means, opportunity, capacity, recognition, even that. And, and, and it's not only a matter of income, it's a matter of, uh, of access to, to quality and not, solely, not only to quantity. Over to you, Antonio. Great, and I think Alicia, you, you brought in uh, this important aspect, you know, inequality, not just in terms of what people, what is the condition which people they live, but, you know, the real redistribution of production capacity, the participation, active passive participation in the processes of value creation and not being excluded from the value that is created and generated in this region. And of course, you mentioned before illicit financial flows, the role of uh, hyper-financialized uh, multinational corporation who are not actually delivering what is supposed at least to deliver in terms of uh, investment and uh, transformation. So these are very important uh, issues, which brings me to some of the questions, a number of questions are coming are actually uh, asking about countries who have been trying to do something different. And again, there is some questions about uh, what is the experience of Costa Rica and Uruguay in this respect in Latin America. Let's not forget Costa Rica is uh, if we think about medical device, it's been a sort of miracle in developing capacity in medical device and pharma over the last two decades. And Uruguay, is, again, is a country which has put lots of emphasis on diversification. We will come back to that uh, in one second, Alicia. Let me start moving ahead with another question, which I would like to pose to Richard and Jayati around. So what is the type of agenda? What is the, this is from Gilad. Isaacs, what do the panelists consider are the essential ingredients for a just recovery in the medium and long term? So let's move from uh, an analysis of a quite dismal situation towards something that actually start giving us some direction, some leadership in terms of thinking uh, around the medium long term recovery. Richard, would you like to start this time? Sure, Antonio. Um, you know, obviously we've in, in the work that we've been doing recently, around the idea of a global green new deal kind of is an attempt to do this in some way now the, the green new deal as it's been advanced mainly in, in in developed countries of course so far you know has some very basic ingredients i think that are common to that narrative albeit again with nuances across uh, regions and countries but you know i think the first thing is and it's very important in this crisis is that you can't, you, we, need a, we need to get rid of the austerity mindset. 
and, and certainly coming out of the, this crisis, if, if, if we revert back to austerity as we did with 08, in 08, 09, then any notion of a progressive agenda quickly goes out of the window. That was the experience. But we, you know, we, so we need this alternative macroeconomic kind of, a kind of uh, it's interesting, what, one country that's kind of followed the Green New Deal route very um, emphatically, it seems at least, is, is South Korea. Uh, indeed, it's part of the political platform of the of the current government that won the election uh, in Korea a, a month or so ago, and 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 the notion there of wage-led growth, which is their kind of alternative to the austerity uh, agenda, is is you know hardwired into their policy thinking. But certainly, that a return to a commitment to full employment, the the pragmatic use of fiscal and monetary policy, credit policy. Uh, to drive a, a, an expansionary agenda has to be a part of any sort of progressive agenda. Um, uh, with a critical role, of course, for public investment. Public, in, as, as, as Alicia said, that's been hammered across the developing and the developed world over the last two or three decades. So public investment is, is key to any sort of uh, resilient recovery, obviously with a strong emphasis on climate adaptation and um, uh, mitigation. Uh, 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 issues, but also more generally around the notions of the care economy and some of the other ideas that have been attached to the revival of, of the public sector. Um, uh, uh, so an, a, a key ingredient, a third ingredient that, that is common, I think, to um, most of these discussions, the Global Green New Deal, is obviously the regulation of finance and the shift towards some kind of much stronger role for public banking and uh, uh, public uh, investment, uh, you know, development banks and, and, and public investment banks of one kind or another. But, you know, controlling footloose capital, again, we, if we don't control footloose capital, it'll be very difficult to design any kind of progressive agenda. So, so it's an critical uh, uh, ingredient. And, and progressive taxation, of course, is part of a, again, seems to be part of most of these Green New Deal uh, narratives. And, and, and finally, a role, again, echoing what Alicia said, for industrial policy, you, you can't shift the kind of structure of the economies in the way that we're talking about without dedicated industrial policy and some notion of strategic planning and all the kind of reforming and rethinking of the state that would have to go along with it. So those, those, you see those ingredients everywhere, when, whether it's in the US with, with, the, with, the, with the, the young uh, congresswomen or in Corbyn in the, U, in the UK, or even to some extent, but very sotto voce in the EU discussion of a green deal that has been floating around since the early part of this year, and certainly in the Korean case too. So, so I mean, that's the kind of model, I think, that we need to be talking about uh, 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 in, 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 in promoting a progressive agenda. The big question, of course, is that is whether this can't be done at the national level. It can be, it has to be grounded at the national level. But it's an agenda that clearly requires international cooperation, international coordination and support. And that's where, you know, our worries begin because the multilateral system is not really designed to do this kind of thing. In, in many respects, it's designed to block this kind of agenda. And so, you know, that forces us to think, if we're thinking about a different kind of development model, to be much more radical, I think, about the reform of the multilateral system, um, not just in trade, where free trade agreements, for example, are an anathema to this kind of uh, agenda, the whole of bilateral investment treaties and the, and the investor state dispute settlement kind of a very highly pro-corporate agenda that, that they, they tend to follow. But also, of course, in the financial, I mean, Alicia talked about the need to deal with the problem of illicit financial flows and tax evasion. I, I, this is critical if we're going to generate the kind of resources we're talking about to, 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 to uh, uh, pursue a, a Green New Deals, whether in Mexico or in, 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 in France or, or in Korea, that's, that's clear. And then it's true also of the international financial system, where, where as you said, your son, as again, as people have said, UNCTAD has, you know, long insisted that a major gap in the system is this inability to deal in a fair and efficient way with sovereign debt problems. And, and that's being exposed once again as a huge hole in the system that is going to have to be fixed if we're going to pursue a much more constructive, progressive kind of development agenda, I think.
great. So lots of important ingredients from Green New Deal, industrial policy, direct in finance. Jayati, who would you like to add to that? Well, well, you know, he said it all already. I think he pretty much <laughs> covered the, the, the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately, basically, but I think what Richard is describing, it's not really green. It's a multicolored New Deal, right? It's, it's absolutely green. We need massive public investments to address not just the pandemic, but all of the issues surrounding the environment, climate change, over-exploitation of natural resources, all of that massive but also it has to be purple right in terms of the care economy we actually have to bring back much more significantly huge emphasis on care and on recognizing and rewarding remunerating care work and actually giving it the kind of social respect that is necessary so huge investments required in the purple economy as well and i think it has to be red yeah i mean it has to be redistributive it has to actually control excessive wealth it has to regulate capital so this red i mean look there are many angles to that you have to have a wealth tax we have to be taxing multinationals and it's true ideally we should be taxing multinationals through an international framework it was almost getting through even in the oecd uh, inclusive process the BEPS process but basically we have to have a system of unitary taxation of multinationals so that they cannot get away with paying these non-existent taxes anywhere in the world and it's possible even if a few countries significantly say we're going to do it on our own, it will force them to, to accept it in a much broader level. It's possible to do it. We need significant wealth taxes, inheritance taxes that would not just enable us to get resources to finance a lot of these things, but also to just reduce the massive inequalities that occur. We have to get rid of the regime of intellectual property rights that is basically only encouraging rent seeking at this point. And if this is going to be even more evident right now when we're talking about these issues, I mean, Mariana and others have done a lot of work around this, right? The, the pressures for controlling the knowledge around the vaccine or treatments to deal with a disease like this. And so we have to actually bring in a much more equitable regime of intellectual property rights. Richard already pointed out we have to control capital flows. We have to have a sovereign debt and other debt restructuring mechanism an international architecture that enables industrial policy and enables growth. Now, all of these seem impossible at the moment. I, it's true. The international organizations are not particularly inclined to get into it. Uh, and certainly the political economy in many of our own countries is exactly the other way. We have, in, our, in my country, we have a government that is completely enthralled to global finance at the moment. To, to the extent that they're unwilling to spend even when you know they can access, when they don't have a foreign exchange constraint and so on. So I think it looks like it's impossible, but I, it's also that darkest hour being just before dawn stuff, because I do think that uh, global, the global elites and capital haven't realized what kind of mess is coming. I mean, Alicia mentioned perfect storm. It is really a perfect storm and it's going to carry them with it. I don't think they've realized yet the kind of international economic collapse that is on its way. And when that happens, then a lot of people are suddenly willing to think of things which they were not willing to accept earlier. And at that point, it's very important for all those ideas to be out there on the table. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that Richard and Alicia and people and I are putting those ideas there so that they're available for the time when it's, when it's very clearly the case that nothing else is going to work. Lots of points around global restructuring, the architecture, the global architecture and views of restructuring of that. And of course, the uh, ongoing discussion on how the vaccine is going to be uh, you know, discovered and what type of companies are going to have some sort of, uh, uh, you know, if they're going or not to contribute to the public good, the global public good, or are going to have some countries, some uh, privileged access to some of these is, is opening up. Uh, at the Pandora box of uh, intellectual property rights, what this global technologies means, who is capturing the rents out of that, and so on. So you are you are bringing in another important dimension into that. Um, Alicia, there is quite a lot that already has been said. Let me also uh, steer you, if I may, uh, because we you know we are used to think about also Latin America as a place where lots of experimentation has been happening in terms of policy and in terms of concrete. I mean, both Richard and Jayati gave us very important global agenda uh, piece. Uh, but there is also quite a lot that over the last 
two decades that in Latin America have been emerging. I mean, Benedest was emerging as a key player in uh, Brazil. Uh, we know that at the moment is pretty much uh, reducing its capacity to provide development finance, but still remains an important example of what a development bank can do in an emerging economy setting. Before, some questions were raising examples like Uruguay and Costa Rica, uh, where again, diversification and some of the specific policies that also Richard was referring to have been deployed with some uh, significant success in specific sectors. So I would like to, you to bring some of also this micro-meso policy intervention that you think we should add to this menu of uh, uh, our agenda, policy agenda for the recovery for emerging economies. Well, thank you, thank you, Antonio. I, I, I want to, to pick up on the, on the phrase of uh, Richard when he say that, that this uh, new deal, and, and I like the multicolor deal a lot. Yeah, yeah, this multicolor deal has to be grounded nationally, but with, a, with an international support. And this is the case of Costa Rica and Uruguay. These two countries, and uh, each of them has a different, of course, structure, but basically what they share is that they are the most equal societies of this region. That, that's for sure. I mean, uh, of course, Costa Rica has been a little bit deteriorating itself and Uruguay also, but overall they have the, the best Gini coefficient of the region. Not the, not the coefficient of, uh, of uh, wealth, uh, wealth still is unequal in both countries, but income is quite equal. Second factor of the two countries is that they have a social protection that is almost universal, which means they have access to a pension fund, they have access to health. It's a universal access. I, I wouldn't say that it's of the fabulous quality, but at least it's equal and everybody has access. And that's very important, I have to say, very. And the third element is that these two countries have made a clear commitment for energy efficiency and renewable energy, particularly Costa Rica. They have shifted their, their energy matrix almost totally. They have almost 75% of their energy in Costa Rica is renewable. And Uruguay is going in that trend as well. Now, different things. Uh, Uruguay is very much an export of uh, exports commodities, basically meat and, and, and uh, I mean, basic products for China, by the way. Costa Rica is different. Costa Rica has a more diversified productive matrix, and I think that's also very interesting. So coming back, so these two examples, I agree very much that these two are the salient economies that have, I would say, a, 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 a very interesting approach to equality and to sustainability. What I think we need, honest, and, and, and let me take, uh, uh, take the case, we, we are suggesting in NECLAC, our next document that we are preparing is on the big sustainability push. And that is, we are proposing an industrial policy, a very forceful industrial policy for this region based on the multicolor deal, let me put it that way, because it's, it's very, is very well stated by Jayati, and I'm going to pick your, your, your word there because it, it, it addresses both the, uh, the green side, of course, choosing those sectors that could be the part of the Green Deal, like energy. So we are studying what's happening on energy in this region, and it's not very uh, good looking, but at least there are possibilities to move into renewables and to energy efficiency. The energy transition, the energy transition has to be a very important pillar of this, of this uh, new multicolor deal. But the second one is uh, uh, solutions based on nature. And that's where Costa Rica also has a, a lot of examples that are very interesting on how nature-based uh, solutions can be part, uh, solutions for climate change, which is the next collapse we're going to have probably in the world. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that we have to, to look at the sectors. Mobility could be one, now with the pandemic, it's a little bit more difficult, but still mobility is one, energy efficiency is another, forestry and agriculture, a new form of agriculture could be another. So we are analyzing industrial, industrial policies based on this big sustainability push. Coming to Brazil, we, we have a very interesting relationship with Brazil. To, to this afternoon, we're having an event on, on, on big sustainability push with Brazil basically with the private sector, the development bank, and the global compact, not with the government. It's interesting. The government is 
is a, I, I hope, is temporary what's happening in Brazil because Brazil has powerful institutions on science and technology, the Development Bank, and, and I hope that we, we can bring back that, equa that institutional equation where you do need a development bank, you do need the planning. We are bringing back planning in this region. ECLAC, we are the secretary, the technical secretariat of the ministers of planning of this region, and we're bringing back that uh, very important uh, policies of planning, planning, territorial policies, because the territorial asymmetries also have a very important uh, thing. And, and, and let me just finish by saying that besides this big uh, sustainability push with industrial policies, by the way, we also look at the welfare state. We have to address the inequality problems. And of course, at the international level, and the care economy, by the way, is one that we are working very forcefully how to bring in the recognition of women's work because that's something that is not happening in many countries. But the thing is that I do believe that we have to go ahead and move together in taxing multinationals. I think the BEPS, the Based Erosion Profit Shifting, is not enough. It's, it's only part of the equation. We also want the multinationals to pay taxes where they make the profits. And that's in our countries, by the way. And the other thing is that tax avoidance needs an international deal. We need to, where is this money going? I mean, at the end of the day, we need to have a fiscal agreement at the, at the international level. And this is something that the developed countries simply don't want to talk about, and they should, because the, 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 the fiscal paradises are precisely in the, in the developed countries, not in the developing. The Caribbean have been punished because of that, but they are not the basic uh, receivers of, of illicit funding. Anyway, so I, I do believe, Antonio, that we should work on, on a global deal, multicolor deal, I like that, uh, moving towards industrial policies, putting forward some examples. I think we do have in the region the example of Costa Rica, which is a good example, but also Colombia is doing interesting things as well. And I would say uh, Chile is also with the private sector moving forcefully towards uh, 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 renewable energy, for example. The energy transition from my perspective and moving away from fossil fuels is, is very important from many fronts. Alicia, thanks so much. I mean, you actually, summarize many of the key issues that we have been really dealing with. We have from macro type of intervention down to very specific industrial policy, which really look at all these cross-sectoral and sectoral opportunity that exist and that can be captured to rebuild actually more resilient economies. I'm very uh, happy that the case of Costa Rica came up again because in a sense, uh, building up uh, an industrial base on around medical devices and all the industry around that exactly means combining that health, resilience, welfare dimension with also the uh, industrial innovation technology side. So there is quite a lot there that uh, IPP is also involved directly in trying to fill this type of discussion to try to look at opportunities that exist in this specific, uh, you know, uh, critical uh, turning point in, in global history. Um, I think we could go ahead for another two hours, but the time is, is running out. So I, I would like to, to thank uh, Richard, Jayati, and Alicia for being uh, such great uh, speakers, inspiring speakers for this, for tonight's uh, event. Uh, I am also uh, very happy to say that all this is going to be recorded so people can go back and look at uh, the IPP website and find more information around this uh, series. Um, I'm also particularly happy to announce that we are going to have next event uh, next uh, week uh, with uh, uh, Professor Caterina Pistor um, and Mariana Mazzucato. We are going to discuss about how to shape markets. I will uh, end up the event with the full details, so uh, a couple of seconds more. And uh, I would like also to say that uh, IPP is very much uh, looking forward to continue this conversation with uh, uh, friends, new friends uh, and institutional partners uh, to actually uh, promote this type of ideas uh, across uh, the academic, the institutional, and the broader society. One of the questions was how people can, what is the role that people can play in supporting this agenda? I think uh, trying to favor this type of conversation, trying to create coalitions of interest and willing uh, is, is part of that process. So thanks again, uh, Richard, Jayati, and Alicia for your uh, excellent inputs.